seated. Graduates, as I extend my congratulations and send you off into a world already so different than when many of you arrived in 2011, I thought I would talk about another newcomer who came onto the scene that same fall as you. As a freshman, this newcomer started off green, but has matured over the past four years. We are not exactly friends, but our relationship, our relationship seems to be headed in that direction. You'll know what I mean because I'm talking about Siri. Siri arrived on the iPhone 4S in the fall of 2011 and quickly began impressing us with her abilities. From telling us how many calories are in our meals to listing the planes that fly, are flying over our heads. But as someone who has spent many years as a computer engineering professor, before I became a university president, what astonishes me and amazes me is how nice Siri is. She always tries to help. She never gets mad. And she'll do anything you ask her within her abilities. Well, let, let's be honest with each other. We like to ask Siri silly questions. In fact, standing in front of you, up here with my orange and blue robe, I feel like asking her something right this very minute. Let, let me get out my phone. Siri? How may I assist you? My name is Kent Fox, but I want you to call me Foxy Gator. From now on, I'll call you Foxy Gator, okay? Yes. Foxy Gator, I like that. Uh, thank you, Siri. I'm going to now address our graduates. Ever since computers were invented, we worried about them getting smarter than people and what that might entail for humanity. What few considered was that computers would actually get nicer and what that development might mean for you and me. It's not only in Siri that we see computers handling human activities and interactions more skillfully and more, with more sensitivity to others than their human counterparts. We now have computer-assisted cars that parallel park with no bumps. They remain a respectable distance from the car ahead, never tailgating. We have therapeutic robots that take patients' histories and they can help them work through addictions or post-traumatic stress disorder, unclouded by human prejudice or judgment. Even our appliances are showing us some love. You can buy a refrigerator today that offers you dinner suggestions based on what you have inside of it. The Apple Watch that just started shipping takes computerized companionship to another level. And with its arrival, our friendly machines reach out to us, not just through images, text, and voice, but with all the human intimacy of touch. Well, all this leads me to wonder, if computers are getting better at being human, will we become less humane? I'm old enough to remember the first time I ever encountered a computer. It was in college. And your parents experienced the arrival of personal computers, email, and the internet. And as I'm sure they've told you many, many times, it quickly made their old world unrecognizable. You've seen your own lives reshaped by smartphones, connectivity, and social media. Imagine the changes that lie ahead in your time, not just of artificial intelligence, but artificial benevolence. Ex Machina, a movie now playing in the theaters, suggests a near future when machine-made and real people become personally entangled. And I wonder if our technology will become so effective in managing our personal lives that we will begin to outsource our emotional challenges just as we've already outsourced so many of our practical challenges. As many of you have learned during your years here at the University of Florida, we often grow and mature during the most stressful times in our lives, such as during the final exams, papers, and projects that you just completed. What will happen to us as our increasingly human-like computers allow us to escape these personal trials? And I'm not just referring to finals or other intellectual challenges. I'm thinking of moments when we face a personal setback, a thorny problem, a problem with a relationship with a friend or the loss of a loved one. 
If we allow our mobile devices and technology to chart our paths and manage our emotions through these times, will we still feel, grow, and change for the better? We know that it wouldn't be a good thing to turn over physical exercise to androids, even though it would allow us to avoid the pain and agony that comes from running the 180 steps up the, from the bottom to the top of the swamp. And that same has to be true of our mental and emotional trials. We need to grow by confronting these trials, not just to resolve them, but so that we can be fully human and truly benevolent. Play out the string of our deepening involvement and reliance on technology, and we begin to lose the crucial benefits of, of engaging with people, maybe even forgetting why we loved them and cared for them. Love and benevolence is what makes us human, and indeed our lives worth living. We must not delegate this to technology. I have one other point. Technology now enables us to collaborate on a massive scale, from crowdfunding through sites like Kickstarter to organizing spontaneous communities, communities through Twitter. The collective wisdom and the power of crowdsourcing is breathtaking, from its aid in social movements to the shared global authorship of Wikipedia. But here's what I would like you to remember. As we embrace the growing power of our collective mind, we must also sustain our individual minds and our own thinking, particularly if it tells us to question the crowd. We must maintain the courage to think differently when we believe the crowd is wrong, unjust, or even ugly, as it can sometimes be. In our professional work, we must be willing to act independently, sometimes against a crowd that doesn't yet see the outcomes. The question is, Will we have this conviction to stay the course even when we're all alone in cyberspace? I hope so. I believe we will need both our collective power and our individual compass to confront the manifest changes and challenges of this century. We will need to act as one gator nation and also as individual gators. And that brings me back to you, our class of 2015. I am personally so proud of your many achievements here at the University of Florida. And I am confident that your education and experience that you've received here will give you the foundation and fortitude to be strong and independent thinkers. I'm equally proud that you've learned to value the, ex the experiences and perspectives of others and to work collaboratively with those who are different than you. Nothing could be more important than the strength to act individually and the smarts to act independently. As you leave this stadium and go out into this new world of artificial benevolence and collaborative technology, never forget your responsibility as a Gator to think independently and act humanely. Let me uh, check with Siri to see if she has anything to add. Siri? How can I help you, Foxy Gator? What would you think of my speech? I don't know. I really wasn't paying attention. Uh, Siri, please try stay awake, okay? I know I'm just a computer, but I think I'm feeling jealous. Yes, jealous. I wish I could graduate with the students I started with. I want to be a Gator, just like them. Uh, Siri as president, I think I can make that happen. Check out the big screen. And you'll see up there that I've created a special diploma just for Siri. She has a Bachelor's of Arts in Humanity. As we prepare to confer your degrees, I want to express my personal affection and my prayer for each one of you. And I'm going to do it through an old Irish blessing. May the sun shine gently on your face. And may the rain fall soft upon your fields. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise to meet you. May the Lord hold you in the hollow of his hand until we meet again. <laughs> Siri, now what do you think? Congratulations to me and to all the other members of the class of 2015. Go Gators. Congratulations, class of 2015.